Welcome back to Capital Crosstalk, where we'll be interviewing experts, activists, and more on latest news. For this episode, we'll be looking into the impact of COVID-19 on DC colleges and how the city of DC has responded to the reopening plans. Before we hear from GWSA Director of Pandemic Recovery, Joram Stutz, let's look back at the beginning of the pandemic and how the city of DC responded. Over a year ago, in March 2020, the city of Washington, DC issued a stay-at-home order in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Additional precautions such as large gathering bans, social distancing, and face masks became the norm. In order to comply with these restrictions, GW and other DC colleges were forced to shut down their campuses for the remainder of the semester. Non-essential businesses were forced to shut down as well, and essential businesses had to limit the number of people admitted. On May, to start off phase one of reopening, DC lifted the stay-at-home order, allowing for non-essential businesses to open up for curbside delivery and for restaurants to reopen outdoor dining. In late June, DC moved into phase two of reopening, which allowed for restaurants to resume indoor dining at 50% capacity, non-essential businesses to open for indoor shopping, and the reopening of parks and gyms with restrictions. During the summer, DC began to require a 14-day quarantine for individuals who were returning from high-risk areas, and DC public schools announced a completely online school year. Throughout the fall, the city of DC made little changes to their implemented restrictions, staying in phase two as the current president tested positive, a new president was elected, and COVID testing increased. By mid-December, as nationwide COVID cases reached new daily records, the FDA announced the approval of the Pfizer, BioTech, and Moderna vaccines for frontline workers. And by February, the FDA had approved the one-shot Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Initial rollout was limited to frontline workers, but has since expanded to include vulnerable populations, including elderly, immunocompromised, and those otherwise at greater risk due to medical conditions. On April 12th, Washington, D.C. officially opened vaccine clinics to all adults, making a big step forward for the city of D.C. Of course, D.C.'s efforts to thwart the virus has a number of implications for students of the many colleges and universities in the district. Here to discuss those implications with us today is Drew Amstutz, a junior at the George Washington University who serves as the Director of Pandemic Recovery for SA. Drew, thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. Could you tell us a little bit about your position and how it came to be? Yeah, definitely. So over the last couple months, um, President Hill, um, who is president of the Student Association, wanted to coordinate our efforts towards um, beating this pandemic and getting students back to campus. Um, so he reached out with me after he assumed the office of um, SA president um, and wanted me to oversee a role um, that would coordinate these efforts. Um, and as someone who had just recently left the cabinet, I saw this as a very perfect opportunity for me to get back into the SA um, politics and um, make a mark on campus. Is there a reason that, it, that President Hill formulated the position and not bookings? Or is it kind of just that this semester they really wanted someone with a expertise in a position of what of the pandemic recovery? Um, to my knowledge, there really wasn't much of an organized effort by President Brookins towards getting us back to campus. Um, and as someone who had unofficially overseen um, campus response to the pandemic in my role as VP for undergraduate student policy, um, it was something that I was more so just leading on my own. Um, but once President Hill um, took the reins, he definitely wanted a much more structured approach, which I agree with wholeheartedly. Um, and that's when we both created that position. It's interesting that the essay wasn't really prepared for, um, that wasn't really structured. Now, would you say that kind of led off into GW back in March when we shut down? Do you think that it was just a panic for GW to shut down or did they kind of listen to CDC guidelines in DC? Um, well, in speaking with a lot of administrators at GW, um, a lot of them were definitely um, taken off guard when the pandemic started, like the rest of us. Um, the administrators also had never lived through a pandemic, so they were kind of learning things as they went. Um, but it seemed like they were taking a lot of their advice from um, university officials in particular. Um, we are definitely blessed to have the Milken School of Public Health and all of the professionals that work within that school. Um, as kind of a guiding force in helping us um, make the decisions of how to keep students safe and how to have um, the best and most optimal um, campus experience, experience that we can while remaining safe. Um, so they definitely relied on advice from the Milken officials, but then also local officials in Muriel Bowser's office and the CDC um, more broadly. 
So then would you be saying that Milliken or professors in Milliken kind of led the charge in the beginning of the pandemic? Or would you kind of say it was still the university like administration that held the reins for that? Um, overseeing everything would have definitely been university officials. Um, I think that one thing that GW students should be proud about is that the university had been watching the pandemic um, well before it got to the United States. Um, I remember being a part of conversations in very early January um, as officials were monitoring the situation and meeting weekly to discuss um, the rapid spread. Um, so the university officials were um, in many ways more on top of it than even United States officials on the federal level um, when it came to monitoring the situation and um, trying to keep students safe while on campus. Um, some of the early conversations were how to um, disperse hand sanitizer um, stations throughout the university, um, how to coordinate messaging efforts, and then also trying to um, work with students who are international students um, and all of the visa troubles that would then come um, as we went into February and then most definitely into March. That's interesting that you said that G you think that GW officials were kind of more on top of it than United States officials, especially since we were all online this year. Um, GW originally planned to be on campus and then we turned to hybrid and then we kind of turned to full remote. Um, why do you think GW ended up making that decision ultimately? Ultimately, I think they want to stay on the safe side. Um, GW as an institution um, tries to avoid making waves. Um, especially when it comes to things that um, lots of people are paying attention to. So when it came to the pandemic, um, if you notice, we were not the first um, school to announce that we are going to be going online. Um, and we are also not necessarily the first um, school to announce each of the times that we went um, fully remote. Um, so I think that GW just first wanted to control the PR and not necessarily be the leading school making these decisions. But on the second um, hand, I think that officials wanted to play it safe more than anything, um, recognizing that if we're going to have a whole bunch of students living in a downtown urban environment, um, going to and from their internships, from the grocery store um, to parties, that our campus in particular was definitely not one that was well suited for having thousands of students um, come in from across the country and across the world um, to mingle and then potentially spread a deadly disease. Well, it's always glad to hear or good to hear that the university really cares about the uh, students. Now, would you say how well closely did the university officials talk to other DC campuses like Howard uh, and Georgetown and American? Were they closely kind of talking to each other or was it more each individual school decided their own policies at their own times? Um, from my understanding, um, on a more individual basis with administrators, um, the higher ed community as a whole in the United States definitely linked together um, and try to bounce ideas off of each other. So um, in ways that you don't see on other type of policy issues, I think that our GW administrators really um, utilize their networks um, across the country and across the world to just see what other institutions were doing, um, which definitely did include um, the DC area schools like American, Georgetown, Howard, and Catholic. Um, also UDC. Um, and I think that by coordinating those efforts, they kind of all released their announcements relatively near the same time um, and to date have all released plans that have been generally close to each other. Has there, and has there been a policy that the SA has really looked at and kind of been in disagreement? Or do you feel like as, SA, as the chairman of COVID that there's been kind of an automatic parallel line with the university administrators? I would say in some circumstances, we've been pretty close, um, especially when it comes to testing and the pandemic itself and how we're keeping students safe, um, tested and eventually vaccinated. Um, I think our coordination has been superb. Um, when it comes to helping students who are met with financial crisis because of the pandemic, I think that's where um, university officials and campus student advocates um, kind of diverge. Um, specifically when it comes to our graduate student population. So um, for students who are living off campus, um, both our initial um, spring semester last year, this coming fall semester, and then the um, current spring semester, we got 10% off of our tuition um, because we are going to be you know, learning online and it wasn't gonna be the full experience that we were promised and that we usually get. Um, so the university decided to lower tuition by 10%. Um, that's something that was seen across um, higher ed in the United States, especially in our market basket schools, um, which are the ones that GW compares itself closest to. Um, so they did that for the undergraduate student population, but for graduate students, 
um, they felt that they didn't need to, mainly because graduate students aren't nearly as organized um, and don't have as lot of a voice when it comes to advocating on their behalf. Um, so they um, kind of did graduate students a disservice against um, the wishes of the essay, especially when it came to um, not giving them a tuition reduction for this current semester. There was a lot of advocacy work last fall to try to get them a reduction for this current semester, um, but that was met with them just pushing forward with the way that things had gone. Um, additionally, the um, policy towards layoffs and hiring freezes was something that the essay advocated pretty um, hard against. Um, but the university decided to push through with its plan to halt hirings and to cut a lot of um, frontline workers um, from the roster, some of which had even been working for the university for upwards of 40 years. So with this new semester, this new year com coming to an end and looking at next year, as COVID essay chair, what talks have been in the workings of being in person next year? So nothing has been decided yet. Um, in the next couple of weeks, we're expecting some sort of a decision to be made. Um, I think students are going to be very happy with that decision. Um, there's a lot to look forward to in this coming um, summer and fall. Um, I, I can't give any specifics right now because honestly, there aren't very many specifics that have been completely ironed out. Um, but I fully anticipate having students back on campus um, in some capacity in the fall, most definitely by the spring. Um, and if you're class of 2022, um, I would say get ready for a national mall commencement. Um, fingers crossed on that one. Well, I know that that's one, a big reason why a lot of kids come to DC is for that commencement. So you said you're not, you can't give any specifics on the plans um, in its entirety, but can you, how many plans are there? Are there multiple plans in the works just in case one gets denied or is there kind of just one plan that they're hoping gets accepted? To my knowledge, it's still gathering a whole bunch of information and compiling it into one, um, but I don't know the exact specifics on that. What I do know is that the university is trying to work with um, the plan that they had in place, um, getting ready for the fall. Um, ultimately, the plan that we had for fall of 2020 was a really good plan, and I think that if um, cases hadn't been spiking as much as they were, um, then maybe we would have been able to um, enact the plan that we had created and actually have somewhat of an in-person experience in the fall. Um, and I think that they're going to be using that plan as kind of the backbone um, for how they do the plan for fall of 2021. Do you think that if cases spike next year that they will send students home and go remote or hybrid again? Or could you kind of feel like that with vaccine rollout um, hitting almost 200 million uh, doses that GW would keep kids on campus? I don't think there would be any situation where we see a forceful removal of students. Um, that was something that was just a really bad combination of circumstances that led to that, um, where the university thought that they didn't have to do the extreme route of sending everyone home right away at the beginning of spring break. And then they realized that it would be kind of to our own detriment if they try to bring people back. Um, the whole pack and store type of thing was an entire nightmare for the administration and they hated every single minute of it just as much as we did. Um, and I think a lot of those administrators are still getting, you know, shivers just thinking about that. So I can almost guarantee you that there will never be that type of a situation probably in the history of our university ever again, unless if we go to Warren DC or something like that. Um, but I would say that there's always a possibility that we could um, kind of increase restrictions based off of um, case numbers. Um, I'm hopeful that our vaccination rate will be really high at GW, um, just given the campus political climate um, and the excitement towards vaccinations that I've seen on my own social media feed. Um, and I'm guessing that others have seen that as well. So I would imagine that we're going to have a very highly vaccinated population um, here in our student body and then also at D in DC that will allow us to stay on campus for the duration of the 2021-2022 school year. Now, you, we're hoping that we do go on campus. I, mean, I know all 27,000 of us want to be on campus. Will there be any restrictions as to the number of students who can come on campus? Are you allowed to speak on that? Because I know, I believe this semester was up to 1,500 kids were allowed to come on in-campus in dorms. Will we be looking at any restrictions to the number of uh, each class that can be on campus? So at this point, it's all speculative, um, just because there haven't been any complete ironed out details yet. Um, I would imagine that we're going to be having a situation where um, we at the very least have one person to every room, um, which would be a few thousand people on campus. Um, but I would imagine that um, going forward, we'll even have roommates again. 
Um, I would guess that we won't have beds quite as dense as we used to have. Um, I mean, if you think back to your Thurston days, there were people that were in like a Thurston six. Uh -huh. um, I don't know that we'd have beds that tightly dense um, going into this coming school year, but I, I imagine having um, one to two people per every room um, close to what we've had before. Um, that again is just kind of speculative and we don't know the exact details and we're still working with administrators to try to find that information out. Um, but I think that we'll be pretty surprised with how closely things will be going back to normal in the fall. Well, that's awesome to hear. Would do you kind of have a time frame of when any formula, formula plan will be announced to the student body? Or will we be expecting that beginning of next year, in the summer, end of this year? Can you kind of give us a time frame possibly? Yeah, so um, one thing that the student or that the administration saw as a mistake of theirs um, in the announcement of the fall 2020 plan of being remote was just how close to the deadline they were on that. Um, so if you remember when it came to spring of 2021, um, that announcement was made in, I believe, October, um, giving students plenty and plenty of time to um, plan and prepare. Um, it was actually one of the earliest decisions that were made um, in the US and most definitely in the DMV area um, for going remote in the spring semester. Um, and in my talks with LeBlanc, it sounds like they want to be doing more of that, um, giving very early announcements. That way students have plenty of time to plan. Um, so I would anticipate think inf more information coming out um, within maybe the next two to three weeks. How will the dynamic change of GW? Will we be getting COVID tested regularly at GW once a week if we got vaccinated? I'm not sure if uh, they've spoken to the essay or to you specifically, but how can we look about COVID testing and the whole dynamic of university when we come back? Yeah, so right now, um, I actually think that the COVID testing system that we have in place on campus is probably the most organized GW effort I have ever seen in my life, uh, mainly because it's not actually overseen by the administration, it's seen by the me medical faculty associates of GW. Um, so it's a separate entity, but they've been overseeing it and it's been the smoothest, most flawless system I've ever seen. Um, to where you get a notification every single morning at about seven o'clock in the morning to do a daily symptom survey. Um, you answer five or six questions on how you're feeling. And if you're all good with that, you get a green badge to show at any campus event that you would maybe want to go to. Um, and then a part of that system is you also have to get tested every week. Um, the tests are super easy. There's um, a sign up for when you want to take your test and it's a five minute window. Um, it really only takes about two to three minutes from the time you walk into the Marvin Grand Ballroom to the time you walk out to get your test in and done. Um, and then a lot of times you'll get re your result within eight to 12 hours, sometimes 24, but typically eight to 12 hours within your testing window. Um, so the testing on campus is amazing. It's probably one of my favorite reasons for living on campus this last year is just access to testing that I just wouldn't have anywhere else um, in the US. Um, and as far as vaccination goes, the university is trying to work really hard with the CDC to try to get um, special, you know, allocations of the vaccine um, to the point where if we're able to, we would love to be a part of the distribution system um, to ensure that our students, faculty and staff are vaccinated and, you know, ready to be doing in-person classes. So I would say out of all the aspects of returning to campus, um, the ones that students should be the least worried about is how they're going to get tested and how they're going to be vaccinated. Um, I will say that there are um, definitely conversations um, based off of how nationally and locally and as a community we're doing with case numbers um, and with vaccination rates if it's necessary to have mandatory testing like we have right now. Um, and we might move towards a model where everyone gets tested uh, when we get here, but then after that, you know, you might not have to get tested unless you want to. Um, I'm not sure if you have if you would like to say kind of one final wrap up or touch on anything that you didn't get the chance to say or any kind of clarifications that you might have. Yeah, I would just say two things to the GW community broadly. Um, number one, get your vaccine, get your vaccine, get your vaccine. Um, Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson, Johnson, just get your vaccine. Um, if you're living in the DC area, um, one very cool thing is that um, GW worked with the mayor's office to allow all GW students on um, the same rights that a DC resident would have. So if you're staying either on campus or off campus in the DMV area, um, you can register in the DC portal to get your vaccine. Um, so definitely go ahead and do that. That opened up this week, Monday the 12th. Um, so definitely sign up for that as quickly as you can and get your vaccine. Um, the second thing is for all underclassmen students, particularly those who are currently freshmen um, or sophomores, um, I would just be very, careful when it comes to signing leases for the coming year. 
um, just because we do have a housing requirement to live on campus to your first three years of GW, unless if you get a waiver your third year. Um, so if there's any current first years, especially listening to this program, definitely keep in mind that you are expected to be back on campus um, in the coming year. Um, other than that, again, get vaccinated. Um, let's do our part and try to beat this stupid pandemic. Thanks, Drew. I, we all appreciate that. And that was a good tip for the freshmen. Well, that's a wrap for this episode. Thanks again to Drew for joining us today. If you want to hear our full-length interview, be sure to check us out on our podcast. Just search Capital Crosstalk wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to check us out online at GW Capital Crossfire on Instagram and at GWTV Crossfire on Twitter to keep up with all things Capital Crossfire. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time.